Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is Corsair's 3500X. This is the ARGB version, but I built in it in two different ways, both with Corsair's RS120 ARGB fans and with IQ Link. So I want to talk to you about my experiences with the case and show you some thermal performance testing, talk about the highlights and lowlights of the case and what it's like to build in and more. So stick with me now as we go into all those different things. I've also done a full in-depth build guide on this PC. If you're curious and want to know more, so check out the links in the description and you'll find the specs of both builds down there as well. As you can see though, I'm using a rear connect motherboard and I've ended up with a very nice looking Corsair setup that includes a rear connect graphics card as well, which is pretty awesome. Now I've tested both of these out and I want to give you my thoughts on which setup is better. The case is available bare bones or with the RS fans or with Corsair's IQ Link fans. To be a bit crazy though, I took the RGB version stripped down and built with the IQ Link setup with the RX fans and a Titan cooler. So I'll talk to you a bit about that as well. Now this is the RX RGB version. And as you can see, when we flip it over, one of the nice highlights immediately is it has a nice large dust shield down the bottom. This is a very big dust shield and it's easily removable. It does cover over the power supply area and the area where the fans get installed. But I want to talk to you about the fan installation a bit later on because that is a bit quirky and weird. It does, however, come with multiple dust panels. So you can see on the top we have a magnetic dust filter in here as well that you can remove and clean in the future and there's also one at the rear all the panels also pull off really easily and give you access to the various areas for the building process or to be able to access these dust filters when you need to clean them which is obviously nice and beneficial the case is quite narrow though there isn't a great deal of space at the back as you can see here there's not a great deal of areas for cable management and routing of those cables and so cable management is very important and I'll show you that in a second. The standard RS120 fans that come pre-installed are also a bit messy in the cable department but one of the nice things about them is they are also daisy chained together and wired up for you ready to just plug into the motherboard so they're fairly straightforward. I've done a detailed wiring guide on them as well. The case can also support a wide range of motherboards, including ITX, ATX, and EATX motherboards, and obviously rear connect motherboards as well. And unlike the 6500X, which is a bit problematic, this one seems like it was more intelligently designed for rear connect motherboards. So I'm using this Tough Gaming BTF, for example, which will slot into the ports here, and then all your connectors go at the back. This is nice in that you can keep all the cables tidied at the rear, but it does mean you have to do a lot of cable management back there. The cables for the fans obviously jut out from the side here though. So even if you do manage to neaten up the back, there's still some excess sticking out here, which is a little bit of a problem. But those connectors do allow you to daisy chain in other fans. So I managed to, for example, connect the rear fans RGB connection to this connector here, which then saved on some hassle during the build process. And it's fairly straightforward because you've got this long cable from the three fans that are pre-installed that can just run to the motherboard and plug in. This is a departure from Corsair's traditional RGB connections though. So no commander core or fan controller will work with them. You have to use the motherboard or an alternative fan controller. In terms of storage, you just have this removable tray which can handle two SSDs or one hard disk drive and one SSD, which is fairly limited in terms of the storage options, but if you're using NVMe SSDs as well, it doesn't really matter. Now this thing's pretty easy to install your drives onto because they just screw in there. And interestingly, they attach to the back of it so they're actually hidden away once you put it back in place. There is one random thing of note here though. I did find that during the build process I had to remove my power cables from the top of the motherboard in order to be able to reinstall this. Now this is a quirk of how I built the PC. If I'd put this in first and then put the power cables in, I wouldn't have even noticed this problem. It was a bit of a weird sort of issue to come across, but it does actually make life a lot easier than the issues I had with the Corsair 6500X, which was a nightmare in terms of the power cabling for the 8-pin CPU power connectors. Now, I mentioned cable management 
in cable management here, you do have to do a lot of it. There are a lot of places that you can tie to, and there were a lot of plastic cable ties included, but I found I had to use extra of my own in order to make sure that it was tied in enough places that the cables would be out of the way for the rear connect motherboard. And that's because there's obviously a lot of ports to connect to the rear, so you need to make sure all the cables are out of the way and everything isn't going to make contact with those connectors, but also that you could just easily access them. And because the back of the case isn't that large, by the time you've plugged all the cables in, you've got a lot of management to do there to make sure you can close the door. One problem I did come across that's worth noting is the case design at the rear, if you're using a rear connect motherboard, I found that the metal bit that runs along the edge blocks the 24 pin power connector. So as standard, you can't actually push this in. I found that I had to unscrew the motherboard, force it over to the left-hand side a bit, and then make sure that I could negotiate that power cable in properly. So if you do this, there's a little bit of leeway where you can push the motherboard over a little bit more so that you can fully seat that power cable in. This is a strange problem to have and a weird design choice from Corsair. I'm not sure if it will impact everybody, but it is certainly a weird one. I had the same issue with the 12 volt high power connector that plugs into the back of the motherboard for that rear connect graphics card as well. So since this case is designed for rear connect motherboards, it seems like a strange oversight from Corsair in terms of the design of the case there and a bit of an issue, but not the end of the world. I certainly didn't damage any cables doing this but it might be a problem for some people trying to work out how to do it or what to do about it. I certainly was stuck for a moment. And I also was trying to tie cables in different directions and then ended up having to tie cables to themselves and to other cables because I was either running out of loops or it just was a difficult area to sort of manage. Now, in terms of the cabling of the fans, these are some additional RS120 fans that I'm installing, but they're pretty straightforward in that they chain from one fan to the next to the next but then you need to plug them into the 5 volt rgb header and chassis fan headers on your motherboard so you can connect three fans like this to those connectors now this obviously relies on you having those connections on your motherboard obviously you'll have chassis fan connections but you might not have loads of 5 volt rgb connectors so that's something to bear in mind if you're thinking about buying this case and using these fans make sure you've got enough connections like that. You could alternatively use a separate fan controller like the thermal right one that I've shown in previous videos, but it's something to keep in mind. Now for the bottom fans, this is a bit strange because the way these sit, these two on the left here, they're sitting basically above the power supply unit. So I've set them to intake, but the one on the left is actually probably gonna be blocked most of the time from that PSU. Now, this is weird also when you use IQ Link fans, because if you put two fans here, as I'm doing, the third fan is then sitting down from them. So you obviously can't daisy chain these fans together in the same sort of way. So you can't click all three bottom fans together. So another thing to think about with the way this has a sort of stepped design to it. So I put the two fans there, for example. Now I'm putting a third intake fan down the bottom here, which by the way is closer to the venting at the bottom, so we'll probably have a better intake than those other two anyway. But then I've got to run a cable from those two fans to this fan in order to then connect it to the IQ Link system and chain it into the other fans, which then ends up looking a little bit messy. Now you could potentially do this in a different way, but if you want to try and connect the fans like this, you're going to have that problem. And I think it's an interesting note if you're planning on using this build and you want to set up with fans at the bottom there like I have done you're either going to end up with a mess or an awkward setup. If you're plugging in the rear fan though, I have found there's plenty of space at the back there for running the cables up through the top. I noted in a previous video that maybe the gap at the top is a bit big and might be a bit too visible, especially if you're side mounting your all-in-one cooler instead of top mounting it as I've done here. Those cables will just be more easy to see and perhaps a bit of an eyesore. The cables at the rear also, as you can see, become a bit chaotic once you've got a lot of these RS120 RGB fans plugged in. But you can daisy chain the connectors together. So I've taken that rear fans RGB connection, for example, connected it to those three fans that are already side mounted and then just simply connected the power from that fan to the motherboard. So they're fairly easy to manage once you understand the logic of it, but there's just a lot of bundled cables at the back here that you have to tie down or do something with. 
The end result looks pretty nice though. I was quite happy with how this build came out, although perhaps it's a bit odd missing that extra fan at the bottom. I just didn't have enough to do the entire system down there. And I figured at least one of those fans would be blown onto the graphics card anyway, and there'll be some passive airflow from down there. Plus you've got a lot of intake fans already set up and then some additional ones at the bottom to help. I also have that nice shelf so that you can put an anti-sag bracket for your GPU there and keep that in place so that you can help support your graphics card, which is one benefit. But you can see here from the side, you can still see a lot of those cables on the fan. So it's a bit ugly down that edge, unfortunately, with the ARGB setup. However, it was fairly easy to build in. In both variations, I want to say it was quite easy to build in as long as your cable managed nicely at the back. It's easy to build in and it ends up looking quite nice. There are some cables visible still with the IQ Link setup, as you can see. I've got some cables running from fan to fan in here, but it doesn't look terrible, I don't think. Quite happy with how that's come out. Now, these are obviously two quite different builds and quite a different one from the 6500X. I've done a full review on the 6500X, and I will say the 3500 is superior. It was much easier to build in and doesn't have the same problems. However, I do prefer the 6500 for the bottom fan intake area, and it is deeper because of the way the dual chamber setup works. So something to consider whether you prefer that or not, but food for thought there. Now I'm doing some benchmark testing, which to be fair, you know, it's obviously quite a bit different. We've got top mounted all in one cooler with RS120 fans. I'll say that I did find the RS120 fans to be quite loud. Under heavy load benchmarking, they were quite a bit loud and obnoxious at times and this is even with them set to silent mode in the bios as well and things did get a bit toasty now these are affordable fans obviously but i did find that they were getting quite loud there i'm also running an i9 in this setup the full specs of for the pc are in the description but you can see that this did result in some pretty hot temperatures on the P cores during the testing and benchmarking with Cinebench and OCCT. Not surprising because obviously putting it under this much pressure is going to lead to issues, but you can hear the background noise of the fans. And that's obviously constant during the benchmarking. And it does actually come up during gaming quite a bit as well. So it is quite loud, I will say that. So the IQ option, with the IQ link setup is preferable in my mind from that however i also wanted to do some other testing so i used port royal and just some general gameplay to see what the gpu performance was like because i wanted to test and see how hot that was getting and with port royal we're averaging somewhere around 65 degrees something like that not too bad for heavy load under benchmarking for quite some time that was actually pretty good this is a stress test with port royal so i actually ran for ages and basically didn't get too hot. You can see the maximum temperatures here in hardware monitor, looking at 64 degrees on the CPU, 78 on the memory and hotspot under this setup with the RS120 fans in that mode. So not too shabby. Now for general gaming purposes, I found that was probably about right. Well, when I was playing Escape from Tarkov, for example, I was looking somewhere around the 60 degrees C mark, which isn't too bad for a GPU. And when you've got the graphics cranked up to maximum and it looks really good and it's still running like that, then it's perfectly fine. But again, I did find that it was still quite loud. The fans are quite loud in this setup. So that's something to keep in mind there. But you can see just general gaming here, the overlay there suggests we're looking at 30 degrees, but the average maximum temperature came out at around 52 here during my gaming testing. Then I moved over to the IQ Link setup. So this is with the RX120 fans and the Titan cooler and the VRM fan module on there. I ran the same tests with Cinebench and found I got a better score out of it. And also the temps are lower, as you can see. So the lower scores, there's no red scores there. It's not getting over 90 degrees as it was with the previous setup. Now, note that the all-in-one cooler is side-mounted now with intake fans, which I actually find is a preferable setup as optimal, gives you better cooling performance for your CPU. So I'd recommend considering this as an option and have exhaust fans at the top instead. I've also obviously got an additional fan here with the IQ Link setup at the bottom, so that could impact the cooling performance of the graphics card as well. 
but this is also quieter. IQ Link fans are quieter and the performance a little bit better. So with gaming here, I'm getting about 42 degrees, as you can see with the current score in the game itself. So you can see in the overlay in the top right here, about 42 degrees C. So a little bit cooler, generally speaking. The fans are running quieter. The CPU is also cooler as well. So there's not as much of a problem here. Now, obviously the IQ Link setup is more expensive, but it does result in better performance. The temperatures here, marginal difference in them. You can see it's about 67 degrees this time on the Port Royal stress test. So ever so slightly different. So interesting variants there. And then you can get a look at the overall maximum temperatures. So 68 degrees on the GPU, 82 on the memory, 82 on the hotspot. But the overall performance is definitely better with the IQ Link setup. And I think maybe it looks nicer as long as you don't mind having those cables visible. But hopefully this has been a helpful and useful insight into the case. As I said, I've done a full build guide. If you want to check that out, as well as other related videos that are linked down in the description, this has been the Provoke Prawn. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.